This is our CTEC Research Symposium 2021. We're going to start off with some student introductions. Uh, they're going to tell you a little bit about themselves, and uh, I'll start us off with uh, Jordan David. Mita'a Dorian David Bauzak, Hina'a Russell David Bauzak, Sitsu Jesse David Bauzak, Sitsia Carol David Bauzak, Suha Jacob David Bauzak. My mom's name is Dorian David. My dad's name is Russell David. My grandparent, my grandmother is Jesse David, and my grandfather is Harold David. So my name is. Jordan David, and I'm from Huslia, Alaska. I am a second year junior at Mount Edgecombe High School. Huslia only has a population of around 370 people and is strongly based on Athabascan values. We are told to respect those who come before us, including our elders. That is why I included them in my introduction. I became interested in marine biology as a child after seeing blue whales on TV for the first time, and I was amazed at how large they can grow and how they socialize. Ever since then, I knew that I wanted to pursue a career in the STEM field. After college, I wanted to become a marine biologist and study either humpback whales or microplastics. And so these pictures, the bottom left shows me um, analyzing shellfish contents. And the top right picture is a picture of my hometown, Huslia. Thank you. My name is Julia Johnson. I'm a second year sophomore, which means I've been at Mount Edgecombe for two years now. I plan to graduate here. I love this school for many reasons. One of them is how diverse the opportunities are here. CTEC is a prime example of one of those brilliant opportunities. And although I don't plan to advance into the science career field, I've been lucky enough to experience a bit of what it's like to be an acoustic scientist. I also adore orcas. They're in my list of favorite animals, so I love that I could do my project on them. Okay, so I'm from Fairbanks, the little red dot on the map of Alaska. It's my hometown. Sitka has become a hometown to me as well. So I added in a picture of Zitka too. It's the one with the golden lights on the water. The top right photo is one that I took. I couldn't bring you a picture of my writing. So I'll show you another hobby of mine, photography. Although it's writing, that's my passion and my talent. I hope to grow up to be an author. Yakwe Alup Itian Litiana Capella Ijen Likia Batom Majo Islands Ijen Kayana Alaska Nasri Majo Ri Inipak. Hello, happiness to everyone. I welcome you all. Um, my name is Tiana Capelli and I am currently a three-year junior. And no, I haven't been a junior three times. I have survived the dorms at Majkum High School for three years now. Um, I am descendant from Kayana, Alaska and Likia Patol Marshall Islands, although I'm living in Fairbanks, Alaska. My desire after high school is to attend University of Hawaii at Manoa to study environmental management and natural resources. My mission is to educate communities who are getting hit by climate change the hardest and help them understanding the or why climate change is happening, then assist them with resources that will help them adapt to the changes while maintaining their culture and preserving our land. 
This is my second year as a CTEC intern, and I am excited to be a three-year intern next year. I enjoy being an intern with CTEC because I am able to do research that I am passionate about. And here is a map. Oh, here is a map right here of, or this is the general area of where Kiana is. And here's Fairbanks. And here is a picture of me that cut a fish at our family's camp up north. And in the background is a picture at 1.30 in the morning at a fish camp. And we had a little bonfire. And here is a picture of the coconut leaves woven ba baskets that are filled with coral uh, rocks. And those rocks or we usually make these for a celebration or just a celebration of life or service. And here's a picture of the berries we pick throughout the summer. And here's a picture of me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rio Baca. I am from Port Orange, Florida, right over here, which is the picture in the background as well. And, but I'm currently living in Sitka, Alaska. I'm a first year junior at Manadamshikam High School. High school. And I joined CTEC because I really love whales, but I'd never really had the opportunity to study them in depth. The first time I had heard whale vocalizations was actually in CTEC this year. And so I'm really glad I joined and had the opportunity to work with our mentors and peers and studies, study sperm whale calls. After high school, I plan to go to college in order to become an environmental engineer. And this class has just made me appreciate marine life all the more and I have a greater desire to protect the environment. And one of my hobbies is just photography. So this is one of the photos I took here in Sitka. Our projects have focused on data collection by the Whale Acoustics Lab with support from the US Navy to conduct research in the Gulf of Alaska. They've been collecting data for approximately 11 years at various sites across the Gulf. So this year in SeaTech, we focused on four different species of whales, humpback whales, killer whales, bared beaked whales, and sperm whales. All of our research has been focused on a number of sites, as you can see here, that have been starred. They range from the continental shelf to the slope to a seamount in the center of the Gulf. This area is of special interest because of its productivity and wide variety of marine mammals. The instruments that were placed at the sites are called HARPS, which stands for High Frequency Acoustic Recording Package. The HARPS are put 10 meters above the seafloor. The flotations at the top keep the hydrophone off the seafloor. Ears or the hydrophone collect sounds. Those sounds can be whale clicks, explosions, anthropogenic sounds, and ambient sounds. As the hydrophone is collecting the sounds, it transfers the sounds to the data logger, also known as the brain. And that data logger collects the data, it stores it on hard drives, and when scientists are ready to retrieve the data, they send a signal for the harp to release its weights and float to the surface. So my study is on the effect of the 2019 blog on humpback whale calls. So the purpose of this study was to determine the impact the 2019 ocean warming event, the blob, had on local humpback whale vocalizations. We were trying to find out if a sudden increase in temperature would cause the whales to make more or less sound, and if we could, to categorize the calls they make into individual types. This is a photo of the blob in 2019. The red colors represent warmer waters. As you can see, the blob heavily 
affected the Gulf of Alaska as sea surface temperature was extremely high in that area. So some background information on the blob. This image shows the sea surface temperature in 2019. The blue color represents cooler than average and the red color represents warmer than average. The blob is a marine heat wave event and it occurred in 2019 off the coast of Alaska. It has affected mainly the North Pacific Ocean and it has increased the ocean surface temperature by around three degrees Celsius. The causes for the blob remain unclear, but it is assumed that the global rising of ocean temperatures played a part in setting off the blob. This study was conducted in Southeast Alaska at Site CB during November of 2020 to April of 2021. Site CB is on the continental slope of the Gulf of Alaska. We picked this location because humpback whales frequent this area and through this way, we could study the effects, we could study the blob effects on humpback whales. My study surrounded humpback whales or Megaptra novingjoe. As you can see from the picture on the left, Humpback whales can be found in all oceans except for the polar seas. They prefer shallow waters, and when they want to mate, they migrate to several locations around the world with warmer waters. They are where crawls, as they eat by lunge feeding. Their main source of food is krill. Humpback whales can grow to be 50 feet long, and their name comes from the hump that forms when they arch their back to begin feeding, and because of that, because of the shape of their dorsal fin. While humpback whales are well known for their complex songs specifically, they make a variety of different sounds. They make both songs and non-song related calls. And there are several types of non-song related calls that are classified. These calls are moans, grunts, pulse trains, blowhole associated and blow, blowhole associated sounds and surface impacts. Only male humpback whales sing. And while because of that, it may seem like the singing is used only for mating purposes, it is assumed that it serves a variety of purposes. These, their songs can be around 80 to 4,000 hertz. And this is um, the humpback whale song. One of our research goals was to analyze sea surface temperature and chlorophyll during a blob year. We also wanted to compare humpback whale calls during a blob year and a normal year. So now onto our methods. First, we characterized the calls of lo local humpback whale calls using a sound trap recorded at Sitka. This data was collected using a high frequency acoustic recording package or HARP. These characteristics we used were the frequency at the beginning of the call or start frequency, end frequency, and duration. I used these call characteristics to run the generalized power law detector or GPL to automatically detect humpback whale calls. Here we have an image from the GPL detector it pulls out the sounds that are within the frequency range and duration that we give it and eliminates them with white lines so we can verify that they are in fact humpback calls. I also use Triton 
to detect calls without the GPL, as the detector pulled many anthropogenic noises that were not calls made by humpbacks. I then cleaned the detections to make sure that I only kept true humpback calls. I organized the calls into a graph, and finally, I compared and contrasted the calls between the warm anomaly, 2019, and a normal year, 2014. So I measured 35 different humpback calls using the Triton logger. The parameters I measured were start frequency, end frequency, and duration. From these measurements, I calculated the minimum, maximum, range, and average for the calls. The average start frequency was around 398 hertz. The average end frequency was 463 hertz and the average duration was 2.25 seconds. We use these parameters to run the GPL detector. Now we're going to look at the environmental variables for 2019 and 2014. On the left side, we have sea surface temperature with degrees Celsius on the y-axis and the months on the x-axis. 2014 is the solid line and 2019 is the dotted line. As you can see, there is an upward trend of an increasing temperature from May to August. There are some months where 2019 is warmer than 2014, including January to April and June to September. On the right-hand side, we have our chlorophyll concentration plot. The y-axis is chlorophyll A in megagrams per meter cubed and the x-axis is months. Again, 2014 is the solid line and 2019 is the dotted line. There is an upward spike in the chlorophyll concentration from April to May in 2014, which we believe to be from an upwelling that happens in the spring. 2014 was higher in all months on average than 2019. Because of this, we hypothesize that there will be more calls in 2014 than 2019. Despite the fact that sea surface temperature only rose by around one degree Celsius, that this, this is still a change that made drastic changes in the chlorophyll concentration. From our GPL detections, we calculated humpback calling hours per day from April 26 through May 9th. We compared this to calling hours per day in 2014, which are detected from previous uh, analysts. On the left-hand y-axis, we have calling hours per day, shown with the bars, and on the right-hand axis, we have percent effort, shown with the dots. And in the x-axis, we have days. 2014 is shown in blue, and 2019 is shown in yellow. The times where there were 100% effort is shown in gray. Across the shaded area, there was a dramatic increase in calls in 2019 compared to 2014. We were not expecting this as we believed that higher temperatures and lower chlorophyll would cause a decrease in humpback whale calls in 2019. This study was important because it helped to identify the effect the 2019 blob event had on humpback whale calls. It would be interesting to do another study that would compare more years and use more weeks to see if the result holds. This study is also important because it gives us an idea on how global warming affects humpback whales. Our results showed that an increase in environmental temperature would cause humpback whales to call more. We are not exactly sure why this happened. It could be because humpback whales need to communicate more when there is less food. It could be because they need to work together more to find food, or it could be something that we haven't yet discovered. Future scientists should study this and see if this pattern holds with future blobs. Something that would be interesting would be looking at call characteristics during the blob. So like looking at frequency and duration of their calls. If they are calling more in warmer temperatures and climate change increases ocean temperature, then that could mean that humpback whales will start calling more overall and deplete their energy reserves by having to produce calls.
cause more. Now for my conclusion. We found that humpback whale calls, the humpback whales call between 95 and 1,376 hertz. We also found that an increase in even one degree in 2019 led to a drop in chlorophyll concentration. Lastly, we found that humpback whales were calling more during high temperature and low chlorophyll times. And that's my presentation. All right, time for our next presentation. I mean, I quickly uh, ask, a, uh, just wanted to, to verify, are we going to, will we have an opportunity to ask questions at the end after all of the presentations? Yeah. We're going to do okay. questions at the end just to make sure that we don't run out of time. Okay, That's awesome. Still happening here at Mount Edgecombe. <laughs> Roger. Okay, hello again. This is a study that analyzes the sounds made around recorded high frequency modulated kill killer whale calls to gain some insight into what killer whale ecotypes are making these vocalizations. The scientific name of the, of the killer whale is Orsinus orca. Orcas have characteristic black and white markings, and though their common name is the killer whale, these animals are actually dolphins. I've included their taxonomy to explain how their family is Delphinidae, the dolphin family. Measuring between 18 to 32 feet in length and 3 to 10 tons, they're the largest species of the family. Orcas have been called wolves of the sea because of their group hunting tactics. Using high levels of intelligence and social coordination, they hunt in teams to take down fish, squid, seal, sea lion, walrus, bird, toothed, and baleen whales. Orcas are what's known as an apex predator, a predator at the very top of their habitat's food chain. Orcas can be found in every ocean in the world. In this image, the species range is indicated by the light blue. Their preference is for cooler waters. They have three ecotypes, resident, transient, and offshore. The range of residents are coastal, while the range of offshores are far offshore. Transients live a bit in between. The image in the corner here is a good visualization of how that works. You can also see the morphological differences in the dorsal fin through these comparison pictures. The ecotypes also have distinct prey preferences, in addition to the amount of vocalizations they make. These are theorized to be connected. For example, transients prey on marine mammals, which may be cause for the fact that transients don't make very many noises. The marine mammals could hear and recognize the noises, which may alert them to their predator's presence. Not much is known about offshores. They're a bit harder to study since their range is so much farther into the ocean. These are the main vocalizations of killer whales. Clicks, buzzes, whistles, and pulse calls. The clicks are for echolocation and often occur in a series. When the clicks are very rapid, so much it sounds to humans like bzzz, this is the buzz vocalization. The pulse call is a very useful tool for distinguishing the ecotype, as they are more specific to each ecotype and can be specific even down to the pod. I've got a sound sample with clicks, buzzes, whistles, and pulse calls.
An orca's whistle is a single tone, typically with modulations. Most whistles are low frequency, but another type of whistle was discovered called high frequency modulated, or HFM. We'll be discussing HFMs today in this presentation. There were two questions that were the leading research questions of this study. What ecotype or ecotypes are making these HFMs? And what, if any, are the other vocalizations around the HFMs? I'll now explain the process of how this study was done. The audio data used was recorded with HARP technology. This is a map of the HARP sites used to collect the data. The times when the HFMs occur had already been marked for me on the audio files at each of these sites. For this study, I used sites CA, CB, KO, and QN. This particular spectrogram shows some of the HFMs from site KO. The HFMs are the little down sweeps. I would play a sound clip of them for you but their frequency is so high that they can't be heard. So my job was to go to the HFMs and the LTSAs and scan the data one hour before to, of the first HFM to one hour after the last HFM. Sometimes there'd only be a couple of these vocalizations. So the logging sets from a site would only be a little over two hours. The longest logging set I had was about four hours. So what exactly was I scanning for in the LTSAs? Well, I logged all other ORCA vocalizations within the one hour before, one hour after time period for the purpose of determining the ecotype. And we can take a good guess at the ecotype through the vocalizations made. In the spectrogram displayed, there's some clicks and a whistle underneath them. Now I'll show you what the study found. The x-axis shows the site and the date of the data set, with a cluster of bars representing each type of the vocalization. You can differentiate between vocalizations with the color key. The y-axis is time in minutes. So we're looking at how much of each type of vocalization occurred in minutes at each site. For example, we see that there were a lot of whistles at site CA and very little clicks, but in almost every other, there were much more clicks than anything else. Because we had much more clicks, we ran an automated detector that looked for impulsive signals to pick up the clicks during the HFM encounters. This detector saved spectra of clicks as well as information about their timing. We use the output of the detector to examine the clicks around the HFMs and compare their properties with the current knowledge of the three ecotypes click properties. What I'm showing you now are just reference graphs to demonstrate the differences between the clicks of the ecotypes before comparing them to our data. So just so there's no confusion, these aren't from our data sets. There's examples of transients, the top graphs, presidents, the graphs on the right, and offshore, the two graphs on the bottom. The graph on each left is the mean spectrum. It takes an average of all those spectra. Its x-axis measures frequency and the y-axis measures the amplitude. Note that the left graph on resident has that little notch at the peak. With transients, this line is very rough and bumpy and offshore, it's very smooth. The spectrogram on the right, this here, shows the spectra of all detected clicks. The x-axis is the number of detected clicks and the y-axis is the frequency. This graph sort of just smooshes all the clicks together so one can compare them easily. And it gives us another pattern to look at. 
this is another example graph for interclick intervals, measuring the timing between clicks. The interclick interval, or ICI, is in seconds on the x-axis. The y-axis is the click count. Here is another way one may differentiate ecotypes. Transients make more clicks with a smaller ICI. The resident clicks have a larger ICI. Transients typically click much faster than residents. Offshores have a very wide variety of interclick intervals. This is now the data from our research. These graphs are structured similar to the reference graphs we saw before. On the mean spectrum, the y-axis is amplitude and the x-axis is frequency. On the interclick interval graph, the y-axis is click counts and the x-axis is time in seconds. On the spectrogram, the y-axis is frequency and the x-axis is the number of clicks. We'll only be viewing the results of site QM today because it had the most clicks to work with. For this encounter, QN in 2013, there were only about 60 clicks made. Combined with the spectral shape of our data and compared to the reference graphs, these orcas are most likely transients. For the data collected from the site QN in the year 2014, there were many more clicks during the two hour window. The data here is interesting because the notch in the peak frequency that we saw before in the mean spectrum is indicative of the resident ecotype. However, there is not enough data to confirm it as belonging to the resident ecotype. This may be offshore. So the orcas from this set may either be resident or offshore. For the discussion part of this presentation, we'll revisit our research questions. Answering the first question, we found that all other vocalization types were present around the HFMs. Sometimes the amount of noise was very little. Quite often, there were a lot of clicks. To our second question, we found some very intriguing data that brought more questions than answers. Transients look to be the ecotype making the HFM signals in the 2013 QN encounter, but to my current knowledge, no literature has recorded transients making the HFM signal before. This is a potential further study to confirm transients as producers of HFMs. As for the 2014 QN data set, no conclusion can be safely drawn as to whether or not it was residents or offshores making those clicks. Site QN is a seamount, so it's at least a possibility that these orcas could have been residents. Bringing up the site map again, we see that Site QN is smack dab in the middle of the Gulf of Alaska. It's much unlikely the resident ecotype made its appearance so far offshore since their normal range is coastal but I don't think it's too much of a dismissible notion. Salmon, their food source, has been declining. One may speculate that this ecotype may be expanding their habitat to look for sustenance. This is another area that could be further explored with future studies. Regardless, we don't know much about HFMs and this study adds a bit more to the existing knowledge. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, this year in SeaTech 2021, I have been conducting a passive acoustic study based on the environmental factors in the Gulf of Alaska. We know the oceans are warming and with the increase of the sea surface temperature that affects the chlorophyll A, a indicator of the phytoplankton. And as you may know, it will, it affects the whole marine food web. But I am focusing, or these environmental changes can affect the behavior of all of the ecosystem. But I am focusing on the killer whales and the Baird's beaked whales that forage in this area. 
My goal of this or in this project is to figure out if there is a relationship between the sea surface temperature and the sound production among these species. Here, I'll introduce the species. The Baird's beaked whale and the killer whales. And as you may know, the killer whales were previously introduced by Julia. So Baird's are found in the Gulf of Alaska and the Pacific Ocean. So why should we care about the species? Even though Baird's have a healthy population, we should start caring about their population now as it, as it is healthy. And as humans, it seems like we only care for animals that are already endangered and we need to start caring for animals before they are titled endangered. Researchers currently do not have much information among these species because because Barrett spend most of their time in deep waters, although this is where acoustic studies play a big part. With the help of a hydrophone, we're able to hear the presence of this species. And I will play a sound, that way you guys will have an idea of what Barrett sound like. On this side, slide, I am showing you the echolocation characteristics. Baird's echolocate when diving deeply, and the, this species can be identified by their fe features and their echolocation clicks and whistles. They are weird because they whistle and not all Baird's are beaked whale whistles. And if we look at this graph, it, I'm showing you the echolocation clicks or the characteristics. And this is a LTSA and it shows whistles, peaks and notches and the echolocation clicks. Here are the two species echolocation clicks side by side and when there are a lot of clicks, you can easily tell the difference between the two species. The Barrett's appear to have peaks and notches that are pretty constant. And here's the Barrett's Beaked Whale LTSA. There appears to be upsweeps in the echolocate or Barrett's echolocation clicks, which would be right there. Although these two species share the same peak frequency. And this is the killer whale echolocation click at LTSA. Here are the methods that I use to analyze the data. I grabbed acoustic data from site CB and CB is right on the continental slope. At this site, it contains a lot of marine mammal occurrences and at this location, there happens to be a lot of human activities such as commercial fishing, crabbing, and commercial boats. This, or the instrument that was placed at site CB was 970 meters deep, which is about 3,182 feet deep. And the duration of the study was focused in March through May in 2014 and 2019. I used the previous uh, log detections from 2014 and 2019 and entered them into PAMGARD to get a closer look at the clicks. PAMGARD is a software developed by Doug Galipsky, or Galipsky that allows us to see the detections. The purpose of using PAMGARD was to look at the average shape of multiple clicks in one The picture in the far right is a sneak peek of the average spectrum 
which is the shaded area right here, of the high frequency clicks in one of one encounter or multiple encounters. I focus in the click spectrum to determine the species of the logged encounters. I looked at the shape and the frequency of the click spectrum to determine the detection. We used PAMPEL, which is our package that was developed by Taki Sakai that allows us to measure the characteristics of clicks and whistles. We used R to we also used R to find the sea surface temperature of each month in 2014 and 19. On the lower right is an example of the whistles we detected. Let's look at the whistle that I that circled in red. I could do an estimate of where the minimum frequency is, which is about two kilohertz and the maximum frequency is around 2.6 kilohertz. Instead of trying to figure out these characteristics manually, Pam Pell goes through and calculates a variety of characteristics from each detection automatically um, to, to make our lives easier. The listed click and whistles characteristics are just the few out of many options we can do in Pampel. We eliminated clicks and detect or click detections with a peak of um, or with a peak frequency no greater than 30 kilohertz or greater than 30 kilohertz. We also eliminated whistle detections greater than 12 kilohertz because they were just background noise and false detections. The way I oversee the sea surface ten temperatures were by using Earth data from NASA and observing the different days, months, and years assisted me by deciding what my comparison years would look like. And from now on, I'll be showing you my results of my research. Throughout the research, I was compares, or comparing 2014 as the cold year to 2019 as the warm year. This graph illustrates the sea surface temperatures for the years of 2014 and 2019. I mostly focused in March, April, and May. The x-axis represents the the 24, or wait, the x-axis represents the sea surface temperature, whereas the x-axis represents the months. The blue line illustrates the year of 2014, and the orange line indicates the year of 2019. As you can see, there is a significant change between the two years. And look at the beginning of the year. And notice how 2014 is a degree colder than 2019, even though 2014 is only one degree colder than 2019. There is a big deal, or that is a, a big deal in the marine life. I picked 2014 and 2019 for my comparison years because 2014 was one of the colder years, whereas 2019 was one of the warmer years with passive acoustic and satellite data. Throughout the rest of the results, blue will always represent 2014 and orange will always represent 2019. Here we have the presence of Barrett's from both years, 2014 and 2019. For each plot, the x-axis is the local time that it was recorded at, the y-axis is the date. The gray shading of the plot is the nighttime hours, whereas the white 
is the daytime and the black marks show the presence of Barrett's beaked whales. There were very few encounters of Barrett's in 2014, whereas in 2019, the presence of the species were more active compared to 2019. It is interesting to see the great difference between the two years because the waters and the environment was much warmer in 2019. These graphs have the same axes as the previous graphs we just looked at, except these show the presence of killer whales. As you can see in 2014, similar to what we observed to Baird's beaked whales, there was not much activity of killer whales, whereas in 2019, killer whales were more active and present. In 2014 and 2019, there's a difference in the time of the encounters. 2014, killer, whale, killer whales were present throughout the daytime and bear, or in, and 2019, orcas were more present throughout nighttime hours. We looked at some of the characteristics of click and whistles between the years to investigate if there is a difference in the sounds that animals were making in different environmental conditions. This graph shows the peak or the click peak frequency of both Baird's and killer whales, Baird's on the left and killer whales on the right. The boxes show the distribution of peak frequency of each year with 2014 in blue and 2019 in orange. For Baird's, there is a difference where the peak frequency was much higher in 2014 than in 2019. But when we look at the killer whales, there is not that much of a difference among the two years. When we look at the whistles, one of the characteristics we considered was the minimum frequency. Baird's show that the description distribution of minimum frequency was smaller between the two years and the median, the middle black line right here, was a little higher in 2019, where killer whales did overlap and the median was constant. This graph is similar to the, pre to the previous graph we just looked at although we are looking at the whistle max or the whistle maximum frequency. Overall, the distributions overlapped between the years of the both species, but the maximum frequency was higher in 2019. In conclusion, we saw that 2014 had lower sea surface temperatures in, than 2019. We also saw that there was a higher presence of buried beaked whales and killer whales in 2019. With the warmer sea surface temperatures, it led to more phytoplankton, which supports more fish and more prey for the whales that forage in this area. Therefore, the warmer waters in 2019 might have brought more whales to this area, we also observed that the killer whales presence changed from daytime 2014 to nighttime in 2019. The switch from daytime foraging in 2014 to nighttime foraging in 2019 may have been driven by the change in prey that are available during nighttime hours, or it could be that we just we observe different ecotypes with different behaviors between the two years. When we look at, or when we looked at the call characteristics between the two years, the click characteristics were different for Baird's beaked whales, although the whistle characteristics were similar in both species. It's possible that the call characteristics change between the years because there were more encounters overall in 2019 and the animals may have been more social and or they were foraging on other food. So they're making more sounds in 2019. So bringing my original question back, 
Is there a relationship between the sea surface temperature and the sound production among Baird's beaked whales and killer whales? And my answer is yes. The warmer sea surface temperatures impact the presence and behavior of, of these species in the Gulf of Alaska. And that concludes my presentation or my research and thank you. Hello, my project is on sperm whale behavior with the presence of fishing vessels. Sperm whales, or Physeter macrocephalus, are toothed whales that primarily eat squid, but they also eat octopi and fish that live in deeper water. They are the largest toothed whales that we know of, with average adult male weighing 90,000 pounds and having a length of 60 feet. They have an average lifespan of 60 to 70 years. And a fun fact about sperm whales is that their head can take up over a third of their weight and a quarter of their length. They have an extremely large head but hold their large melon, which holds a great amount of spermaceti, which gave them their name. And spermaceti and the melon, uh, the large size of those, that's what, how they can produce some of the loudest sounds of any organism. Sperm whales can be found nearly anywhere in the world. The darker blue on this map in the middle area represents the female and young male sperm whales primary range. And the light blue represents the adult male sperm whales primary range. This was discovered when scientists analyzed the score historical whaling records. Notice that whalers caught mostly males in the Arctic and a combo of both adult males and females in the Gulf of Alaska. Scientists also used research cruises where people make visual observations with binoculars and found only big solo sperm whales which means they're male. The sperm whales habitat consists of deep ocean, but they can also be found in areas that can provide a deep water near shore habitat, such as continental shelves, slopes, or canyons. The, the LTSA and spectrogram shown here exhibit an example of typical sperm whale behavior. The x-axis represents time with the LTSA at the top being two hours and the spectrogram at the bottom being 16 seconds. The y-axis represents the frequency in kilohertz from zero to 100, and the colored bar represents the intensity of the sound with former colors being more intense. This is what their echolocation sounds like. Something to note is that their echolocation was extremely common in our acoustic data. They use echolocation to forage, navigate, and get a sense of their environment. Males typically click once per second, while females typically click twice per second. So this was a male in this example. In the Gulf of Alaska, sperm whales display a unique behavior, depredation. Depredation is when an animal feeds off of food that others have caught. In this case, it is when sperm whales take fish from fishing boats. This is important to study because when they take fish from fishing vessels, the sperm whales increase their chances of getting entangled, hooked, or otherwise harmed. The more we find out about depredation, the more we can do to try to prevent it so that less sperm whales are injured and less fish are taken from the fishermen. Now you can hear the sperm whales echolocation in the background and it's speeding up as it gets closer and closer to the long line. And here it comes. In this video, you can see that the sperm whale swims up the long line and uses its long jaw to increase the tension on the line, releasing the fish from the hooks for the sperm whale to eat. Sable fish, otherwise known as black cod or butterfish, are fish from March 1st to November 15th, which is when depredation mainly occurs. And there goes the black cod just floating off in the distance for the sperm whale to eat. Our research goal was to explore the differences in sperm whale acoustic behavior when fishing vessels were present and when they were foraging naturally. We then narrowed our search to focus on the sperm whale's ICI and find if there are any differences in ICI between sperm whale encounters 
in fishing with fishing vessels and natural foraging encounters. ICI is important because it's used in density estimation, which is the process of estimating how many animals are present in a certain area. And this information can be used to monitor changes in population size over time. The Whale Acoustics Lab recorded at two sites using HERPs, CB and KOA. At least those are the ones that we're using. CB is a continental slope, which is a steep slope from shallow to deep ocean. The instrument at CB recorded from April 25th to September 27th, 2019, and the instrument was 970 meters deep. At KOA, the Kodiak Island site is just like CB with, because it's on a slope, and it recorded from April 24th to 2000. April 24th to September 27th, 2019. At KOA, the instrument was 1,000 meters deep. The sample rate for both instruments is 200 kilohertz. Recording in Alaska is important because it's a very productive area, a huge fishing area, and due to both of these factors, it provides 60% of the fish in the United States. We got most of our shipper information from marinecadaster.gov. And we downloaded all of the automatic identification system data, or AIS, in the Gulf of Alaska for our periods of interest, which was when the instruments were recording. Automatic identification system is collected by the US Coast Guard and tracks all the vessels in the United States waters in real time. The picture in the top right is a screenshot from the fishing vessel activity on one day in particular. After we got all the AIS data, we filtered that data to find vessels that were within 10 kilometers of each hydrophone because we're not able to record every vessel in the Gulf of Alaska. We then filtered it again for fishing vessels only because we didn't need cargo vessels or passenger vessels. We only needed fishing vessels. And then we filtered it one last time by what activity the fishing vessel reported they were doing. Like they could say they were transiting, actively fishing, or they were just at rest and we focused on the ones that were actively fishing. We then looked to see if we could see these vessels in our acoustic data, and if we could, to see if there were sperm whales present at the same time, since we we're interested when they were both present. We looked up the vessel online and made sure it was a vessel that would target black cod or sablefish, because that's what the sperm whales eat. And then we finally recorded the times when both were present and any other interesting behaviors we came across. This is what a ship sounds like in the acoustic data. Not a sound you want to hear every day. So in order to analyze the data from the encounters we logged, we used an automatic detector to detect sperm whale clicks during our times of interest, which were the times with ships and sperm whales, as well as from encounters that are presumably natural foraging encounters for comparison. Typical foraging for sperm whales are on average 45 minute dives from 600 to 1000 meters. For the sake of this presentation, we're gonna call our encounters depredation encounters, although there's really no way to be 100% sure whether the sperm whales were actually depredating during these times. After the automatic detector finished, we used a two sample t-test to investigate any differences in the time between clicks or the ICI between the depredating and natural foraging encounters. So we found seven depredation encounters with ships and sperm whales at both sites. Most encounters were in KOA, but two were also in CB. Most of the encounters were from July to August, which is also the, the peak of the black cod fishery. We know it at the location clicks at all the sites, but we also know slow clicks in two of the encounters, one and three. Slow clicks are used by males to communicate at the surface. Most of the encounters had at least two animals. So the slow clicks in encounters one and three show that they were potentially communicating with each other. These are time series which show the sperm whale and fishing vessel presence at site CB and site KOA. The x-axis represents the 24 hours of the day, and the y-axis represents the deployment time from top to bottom, April to, April to September. Black is, or gray in this case, is sperm whale presence, and red is ship presence. And site CB seems to be more preferred by sperm whales, but you can tell by all of the lot more gray marks on the graph. But KOA seems, has a lot more shipping activity. And this could be because it's closer to Kodiak Island, which is a popular shipping port in the Gulf of Alaska. 
The period of time with the most spermal activity in both sites is July to August, which is also when there's the most shipping activity. In the previous slide, I mentioned that most of our encounters were in Kway from July to August, and this is most likely due to the high sperm whale and ship activity in Kway during this time. These are box and whisker plots, which show the difference in the ICIs between one of the depredating encounters and a natural encounter from the same month and site. And N represents the sample size that we had for ICI. Encounter three had a large ICI because it contained fewer ICI samples, so we didn't include that in our data. Oh wait, sorry. It had a very small sample size, so that's why we didn't include it. And the y-axis is the ICI in milliseconds. The Matthias et al. 2012 study found that ICI was larger during natural foraging behaviors with a mean of 0.85 seconds and much lower for deep and shallow depredating lives dives with a mean between half a second and a third of a second. In our data, we found significant differences between the ICI of depredating and natural encounters. However, there wasn't a consistent pattern. These three encounters, of the depredating encounters had a larger ICI. But for these bottom three, the depredating encounters had a smaller ICI. So this could be related to the sample size or which encounter we had to take a sample of, the natural encounter or the depredating encounter. These three, we had to take a sample of the depredating. These three, we had to take a sample of the natural. So that could be why they're different. Now, these are just some of the other interesting or unique encounters that we discovered. The first one has spermal slow clicks, which they use for, for communication, along with the ship in the background. Slow clicks are, are one every six seconds or so. And then the one on the right is an example of multiple sperm whales echolocating at the same time. So this research matters because we discovered whether or not sperm whale ICI changed when they were depredating compared to when they're foraging naturally. The ICI is important because we need to know how many sperm whales are out there using density estimation, which includes knowing how often they clip. If their ICI differed, we could account for that when doing density estimation so we know if their population is increasing, decreasing, or steady. We also discovered that although most of the depredating ICIs did differ from the natural foraging ICIs, there's no constant difference of whether they were greater than or less than the sperm whale's natural ICIs. This means that when engaging in density estimation, there's not a huge difference to account for in regions that have lots of depredating encounters. In future research, it would be interesting to know for sure whether a sperm whale was depredating or not in encounters using witnesses from the boats. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. And a huge thank you to our mentors, Anne Simonis, Natalie Pastaldian, Vanessa Zobel, and Morgan Zegenhorn, who have helped us every step of the way. And we would also like to thank the Scripps Well Acoustics Lab for providing us with access to HARP data and support and analysis, especially Dr. Josh Jones, Professor Rex, and Professor Hildebrand for their continued support of the CTEC program. Thank you to Noah for providing support and analysis. And lastly, a huge thank you to the US Navy for funding this research in the Gulf of Alaska. And from the students, we would also like to thank our mentor and our teacher, Mr. Mahoney.